Good evening, everybody. This is Fawaz al uh, president of Gulf Intervention Society. would like to welcome you all in our special uh, webinar tonight, about, uh, talking about the updated and, and uh, uh, TAVI. Uh, hopefully, in the next 90 minutes, we'll go over step-by-step uh, uh, -step how to do a uh, uh, TAVI procedure and the most updated in, uh, information about uh, this procedure with a special consideration on uh, Portico system uh, by Abbott. I'd like to thank uh, Abbott Company for their sponsorship. I'd like to thank you for attending with us today and thank our uh, uh, speaker and panelists for free, uh, their time tonight to be with us. Uh, so without any further ado, we're looking for this 90 minutes of full of education and the structural heart disease. I'd like to welcome um, all our speakers, Dr. Uh, Coachman from uh, Poland, uh, Dr. Maisano from uh, Switzerland, and Dr. Fadi Sawayan from uh, Lebanon. And we, are dear, uh, we have dear panelists, Abdurrahman Mughiri from Saudi Arabia, and Dr. Mohammed Andro from uh, Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Uh, we'll have a three presentation, uh, then we'll try to stop after that for uh, uh, panelists and speaker disc discussion and, and uh, uh, comments. Please feel free to send me uh, all your questions and comments so I can deliver it nicely to our speaker and panelists. Dr. Coachman, please, your, this is your time. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. And I would like to warmly welcome you from Warsaw, uh, uh, where I work as an interventional cardiologist uh, in the uh, Medical University of Warsaw. Uh, we have established our, our TAVI program uh, like 10 years ago, and I will now to try to, to guide you step by step through the, through the TAVI procedure. Uh, but before that, I, I would like to thank the organizers for this kind invitation, and I hope that this presentation uh, will be interesting both for those who are at the early stage of the uh, TAVI skills development, as well as for uh, experienced operators. Uh, these are my conflicts. Uh, and before going into the details, uh, I will just would like to make one uh, general comment that uh, basically TAVI begins with appropriate patient selection. And uh, uh, the local heart team should assess the clinical data, the laboratory tests, and of course, uh, imaging results with uh, CT uh, being the most important as it allows for complete patient assessment is absolutely crucial in pre-procedural planning. We can uh, uh, accurately measure the aortic annulus, uh, evaluate the all access roads and also create the high resolution 3D reconstruction uh, of patient anatomy. And the, the, the first thing I would like to focus on is, is vascular access. Uh, unfortunately, uh, now 90, 95% of all TAVI procedures can be done via transfemoral uh, road. And I said fortunately because this is uh, the easiest and the safest way to do the procedure. Uh, and again, CT is essential uh, where we basically should focus on three critical factors, which are diameters, amount and pattern of calcification, and also tuberosity. Uh, because we know from some studies uh, that the predictors of uh, VARC major vascular complications are, uh, for example, the shift to femoral artery ratio, which corresponds to the, to the size of the artery, of course, every center experience and the burden of uh, femoral artery calcium. And although uh, uh, we have moved forward, the vascular complications are still quite frequent, even in the contemporary times where we are using uh, the second generation devices like Evolute R or Cypin 3, still the, the rate of, of vascular complications is around 6 7%. And we know this very well as. Uh, the uh, negative impact on patient outcomes they have. And this is the uh, uh, analysis of partner trial where those patients with uh, vascular complications has had uh, almost twice as high the death rate at 12 months as those without these this complications. So uh, 
Some say, and I've heard this at one of the TCT meetings, that TAVI is like 80% peripheral and only 20% cardiac. So how to obtain safely the transfemoral access? Well, you can do it by surgical cut down and closure, but we as interventional cardiologists like the a complete percutaneous approach, and this can be guided by ultrasound or by angio. And I know that there are centers like Professor Maizano ones that they completely switched or almost completely switched from angio to ultrasound guidance, and they have fantastic results. But on the other hand, uh, still probably the majority of centers uh, is using the uh, angio guidance. Where to puncture? Well, obviously, it should be the anterior wall of the, of the common femoral artery. It should be below inguinal ligament and before uh, inferior epigastric artery. Uh, stay away from small branches and from uh, calcifications. The fluoro or angio guidance can be done either from the contralateral side or from the ipsilateral side. And I am kind of fan of ipsilateral side because this is a single-sided access. You don't have to puncture the, the, the contralateral side. You don't have to puncture the radial artery. You just insert the five French sheath somewhere at the bottom of the femoral head over the regular wire. You can use it then for insertion of the pigtail. And at the end of the procedure, you can again exchange the pigtail for the safety wire. And this enables you almost immediate reaction in case you have some complications. Like here, where we were about to finish the procedure, we made a control angio after suturing the proglide, and there is some leak uh, from the femoral artery. So you can immediately put a peripheral balloon, keep it inflated for a couple of minutes, and uh, 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 the problem is basically solved. Uh, if it still bleeds, you can keep it inflated call for vascular surgeon. However, uh, in some cases, we need an alternative access. And this is an example of, uh, of one of our patients, severely obese lady with an additional problem, which was the abdominal, large abdominal aneurysm. And obviously, uh, the transfemoral access uh, would, not be the best, uh, would not be the best option. Uh, which one to choose them, it, it, it's not so easy because, you know, when we, well, uh, assume that an average center, average study center does like plus minus 100 cases a year, and even if there are 7% of, uh, of non-transfemoral uh, cases, this is only seven patients or seven cases a year when you do an alternative approach. And it's not easy to learn and it's not easy to master this alternative approach. That's why I think that uh, if possible, it would be one uh, default strategy. And I believe that transcarotid is very promising. Why is that? Because when you look at the, at the result, these are not great numbers, but still the uh, 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 complications rate is very similar to that what we see in transfemoral cases. Hospital mortality 2.4%, 30-day mortality 3.6%, uh, 30-day stroke 2.4%. And it compares favorably, for example, to transcaval uh, approach or to transaxillary approach, either with uh, self expandable or balloon expandable valve. Uh, so that's what we did in, in, in this situation where we surgically exposed the left common carotid artery and implanted the uh, Evolute R. This was the lady with a degenerated uh, bioprosthetic valve. This is the, the positioning of the, of the Evolute R, and this is the final acceptable result. You can also choose this, uh, this transcarotid approach uh, in more um, uh, challenging cases, like, for example, here, where we deal with horizontal aorta and still uh, going from, from transcarotid, you can have a very nice and high implantation. 
and high implantation is, is, is something very important. And now I will skip to the next issue, which is valve positioning. Valve positioning is not an easy <laughs> case, uh, not, not an easy situation because uh, we know that the uh, device plane uh, is not the same as uh, as an uh, annular plane. And when we, for example, move codal or LAO, we are off annular plane. And there was this nice presentation by Dr. Fraser uh, at last meeting in, uh, in London where he calculated that moving 10 degrees uh, caudal or LAO uh, uh, moves you one millimeter of annular plane. And when you add additional 20 LAO or 20 caudal, you are now four millimeter of annular plane. And this is very important because it changes your perception of how high you implanted your valve. For example, here, uh, LAO caudal, traditional way of looking at, the, at, at our implants. It seems that it's a perfect, uh, perfect implantation, two millimeter below annular plane. But when you move your C-arm to the caudal uh, angulation, well, it's still not bad, but it's four millimeter lower than we thought. And this Aereo codal approach resulted in, in a fantastic results. Uh, the, uh, the PPM rate in self-expandable uh, self valve was only 3.5% in a cohort of, of 200 patients. So the current method of implantation, I'm not saying old fashioned, but current method of implantation uh, tries to incorporate two different things in one and, and, and it doesn't work very well. For example, if you try to obtain an annular plane, you are off the uh, delivery system plane. And if you try to correct for the, for the delivery system plane, you are off the, the annular plane. And this was very nicely presented uh, uh, by Dr. Nicolo Plaza at many meetings. The last one was at TBT 2019, where he said that the gold standard is to have both in one fluoroscopic viewing angle. So this is the concept of the so-called double S curve, where you find a, a point where both the delivery system and the aortic annulus are in one plane. And fortunately, you don't have to make all this uh, uh, complex uh, analysis because in the majority of patients, not, not in 100%, but in the majority of patients overlapping the right and left cusp and isolating the non-coronary cusp is the way to go. Uh, why is that? Because if we go to area codal, we are resembling the 3D echo uh, 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 viewing, where the LVOT is elongated. When you are in a LAO cranial or codal, the LVOT is foreshortened. Uh, here, the free chamber view that is area codal and the LAO, the way we used to do it, is actually a two-chamber view with foreshortening of the LVOT. Uh, the other uh, issue regarding the implantation is the delivery system position. This is an example uh, where we uh, implanted the portico, and you can appreciate that uh, the, the, the position of the delivery system is just in the middle of the uh, aortic ascendant, uh, neither on the inner curve nor on the outer curve, just as it should be. And we have pretty nice result implanting the portico valve. However, you should not be satisfied with just one shot. You should always check in other projection and you can see how constrained the valve is in the other projection. So we always check in, in at least uh, uh, two angulation. Of course, 
it requires post dilatation because such a constrained valve uh, uh, may uh, have a negative impact on the on, on the valve durability, for example. So it was post dilated, and and this is the um, final result. Uh, this is an example of. Uh, mm, Mal-positioning <laughs> mal mal of the delivery system because you can see that the, the delivery system is very much on the inner curve of the ascending aorta. It creates much tension. And this was our early phase of, of, of TAVI programs. And uh, uh, it ended up with a pop-up of the valve of the aorta. So we have to, of course, snare it and, uh, and put the second valve to obtain an acceptable result. So these are the small uh, but important technical issues to, to really obtain uh, the, the, the good result of, of your procedure. And uh, the last thing I would like to tackle is the low coronary takeoff because uh, the coronary obstruction is fortunately quite, or even not quite, but really rare. Uh, but uh, if it happens, it's generally catastrophic. So uh, we should always look for the hive of coronary ostia. It is, uh, you know, uh, sinus of aortic valsava, uh, very important. Uh, should be specially checked for when we when we go for the valve in valve um, procedure or if we have a large calcium nodule especially on the left cusp and this is another case uh, um, uh, with the lady with bio uh, degenerated bioprosthesis trifecta 21 millimeter with many comorbidities where uh, you know this is the the, the echo uh, really degenerated uh, bioprosthesis, no significant lesion in coronary angiogram. However, on CT, there was a very low coronary takeoff with the uh, uh, distance from the annulus to the left main uh, three millimeters and to the takeoff of the right coronary artery, roughly four millimeters. Uh, and uh, we calculated the virtual valve uh, distance to the uh, uh, left coronary and to the right coronary and, and it was six and 4.3 millimeters accordingly. So we decided to, you know, lodge this low discussion about the case and we decided to, to, to go for double chimney technique, uh, which means that you uh, protect both vessels with uh, stents and then implant the stents uh, during uh, uh, valve uh, deployment. And that was the, the result. The, the, the procedure was done like eight months ago and fortunately the, the, the patient is okay. So uh, going into conclusions uh, with this short presentation, I'm just checking whether I'm still in, yeah, I, I made it even quicker than I thought. Uh, so uh, multimodality imaging, including CT, is, is crucial for pre-procedural assessment in all TAVI candidates. And meticulous attention to vascular access and closure is key to avoid severe complications. In case the transfemoral access is not feasible, the transcarotid approach seems to be a reasonable alternative. And the CASP overlap technique facilitates high uh, valve implantation, which is essential in lowering the risk of PPM. And finally, the assessment of potentially risk of coronary obstruction is crucial, especially in low coronary takeoff and must be appropriately addressed. I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for the department. It's a great presentation, a step-by-step -step how to um, uh, start your program and, and do TAVI in, in, a, in a great manner. Uh, just allow our uh, dear panelists to comment, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman. Yes, it was a great presentation and uh, tackled all aspects from the selection to the uh, anatomical assessment to the uh, uh, access site, the alternative site, 
uh, and he uh, uh, raised the point of the carotid as, as he uh, prefers. Uh, in addition to the subclavian, also for uh, certain patients is, is preferable. Uh, so is the selection of the site is, is very important. And the uh, last point was the uh, positioning of the valve and from the uh, initial experience with the uh, conventional uh, deployment of the valve now to the uh, new uh, between the cusp of our lab or commercial alignment. It was it is a great presentation and I think it's, it's, a, it's excellent and he gave us the comparison between the uh, differences of the uh, devices de deployment, the great importance of the landing the valve and the uh, greater curvature because it gives the stability more than the short uh, or the uh, less curvature. So, uh, and he, uh, he gave us the example of uh, valve bobbing up because of the uh, uh, malalignment. So it's, it's very important for from the learning points from that uh, aspect. Uh, in addition to that is the coronary protection in case of the uh, of the high risk patients. Because nowadays we go as low as six millimeters distance. It's acceptable for certain devices. Vortico valve is one of them. Uh, and also uh, uh, some of the generations of the new balloon expandable devices also can go to the uh, down to the uh, as low as six millimeter distance from the annulus. And this is just my uh, uh, observations on this uh, in this part of the presentation. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdrahman. Uh, Dr. Andron? Uh, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. I think, uh, as Dr. Abdrahman mentioned, you've covered all the aspects of uh, implantation, right, from the importance of using uh, ultrasound guidance uh, for vascular access, which I think is commonly used nowadays. Uh, into uh, the navigation around the uh, aortic arch and then the implantation technique uh, and the S-curve and um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the cusp overlap, uh, which is very, very interesting. And I, I think some, some people, they use uh, uh, now, for example, the ARIO caudal view to implant the valve and don't you, uh, they use only, only that view. And then they check maybe in the LAO just to make sure that the valve is um, on the left side is opening okay. Um, and, and also you covered the aspects of uh, low uh, coronary uh, uh, origin and how to protect the coronary arteries and that, that's very, uh, very nice. Uh, and uh, I think you covered everything. And the, the importance of this uh, double S curve on the low uh, rate of uh, uh, pacemaker post tower. And I think that um, probably with the experience and, and the new implantation technique, I think, uh, the uh, um, uh, pacemaker rate uh, post uh, TV uh, post uh, transcatheter valve implantation has been reduced to below, I think, 10% figures. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Dr. Mohammed. Now we'll move to the second presentation, Dr. Messano. Yes, I will share now my screen. I appreciate it. So well, first of all, I, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of being with you and to share a uh, few thoughts about uh, TAVI and uh, the current challenges. Uh, these are my conflict of interest, uh, including that I am a consultant for Abbott that have been, uh, for many years, I've been collaborating on the R&D for the Portico system. I read with interest a, a nice paper on uh, your intervention, which uh, is a kind of a summary on the current open issues on TAVI. And I will uh, somehow go through some of these uh, points with you. I really suggest you to read this article, which is very well written, and uh, make uh, a good summary of what is still a problem today. I just would like to mention to you that I did I actually I didn't do it. I was with Antonio Colombo, so I participated the first study on the table in 2004, and this was really a challenge. Uh, today is much less of a challenge. I think we learned a lot. Uh, technology improved a lot, and uh, today, TAVI is a solution which can be provided to very low-risk patients, uh, probably to all comers. 
in uh, at least in those countries which have uh, enough resources to offer this therapy uh, to low risk patients. So for those who don't know, I am a cardiac surgeon and uh, I am not against uh, TAVI since the very beginning because I believe it is a great solution. But uh, I think uh, from a surgical perspective, I need to ask this question. Is uh, technology today so good that we can offer TAVI to everybody? Well, the answer is no. Uh, and we really need to understand that the main challenge is a cultural challenge. We need to understand that there is a paradigm shift. Till now, we have been thinking about TAVI for those patients who are high risk for surgery. From now on, we need to understand who are those patients who are high risk for TAVI. So that is going to be the main issue because patients will require TAVI. All patients will come to us to do TAVI. This is a very old video of the old generation patients. These, are, these were inoperable old patients. We were very happy of this outcome one day after the procedure. But people see this on the media. So Mick Jagger had Tavi and few days after got this uh, video on Twitter. So this is stronger than any, any evidence, stronger than any trial. Every patient will come to us and ask Tavi, can we give Tavi to everybody? Well, this is a, an important question. For sure, you know, we, we went from the state where uh, aortic replacement was the only uh, option for aortic stenosis and through the stages, and this was a little bit like more or less 10 years. In 10 years, we are at the stage where surgery should be performed in those patients with contraindication to cater procedures. Just like for other procedures, like a ASD closure or balloon valvuloplasty of the mitral stenosis. So <clears throat> it is a deja vu what we see. I mean, this happened with coronaries, is happening with TAVI, will happen with the mitral in the future. This is uh, data from the SDS database that shows that the number of uh, isolated aortic valve replacements with a cater based approach is. Uh, uh, already in 2005, uh, crossing uh, the line with surgery. So it is an unstoppable evolution. Now the first question is, who should do it? And one thing is for sure that everybody wants to be part of this uh, successful story. Everybody wants to do it. Everybody, every hospital, every physician, everybody. And this obviously introduces a challenge. Uh, what are the requirements for quality? Uh, should be TAVI performed everywhere, like PCI? Uh, do you need a surgeon around or not? Maybe not. Uh, what is the minimum number of TAVI to deliver a, a, a quality, uh, a high quality procedure? Well, you know, there are some guidelines and obviously there are differences between uh, countries, but uh, uh, the main issue here is uh, besides the fact that everybody wants to be part of this story, we still need to understand that today, different from before, we need to deliver a very good treatment to everybody. Uh, there is no more room for improvisation. There is no more room for mistakes. Nobody can make a mistake like we have done at the very beginning. We did a lot of mistakes. You know, we are very expert because we made a lot of failures and we learn from failures. But today is not any more possible, it's, and it sh it's not acceptable to make any mistake. So the quality is an, an important point. And a, a functional heart team is key element to make the least number of mistakes as possible. As we heard before, patient selection is already a first step, but it's not only there. It's not only for selecting the patient, it's also for the environment, it's also for the safety. It is for the good of the patient, of the patients that we have to work together. And obviously, volume counts. I don't think that a high volume center has physicians inside of this center who are all good. And I don't believe that might be, there might be a small center delivering the best practice. But in general, the more you do, the more experience you, you, you sum up and the more solutions you have in case something goes wrong. And we have seen this data already in different publications that 
as the number of procedures is increased, the safety of these procedures is obviously higher. The other question is, again, there are these low risk trials. And what should we do? In selected patients at low risk surgical risk, we've seen from different trials that CAVI is at least non inferior to surgery in to regards to all cause mortality, stroke, and rehospitalization in the, in the short term. It, talking now one, two years, it's still the early stage. The problem is that we need to be very, very clear that these randomized studies are very selective. These are non all comers, and there are a number of patients who have been excluded from these trials, and we need to know who have been excluded. So we know that uh, patients with extreme calcification, with bicuspid valves, these patients have been excluded, larger anatomies, uh, aortic regurg, and so on. So again, I'm not, I don't think that TAVI should not be reserved to a lot of patients, but we still need to understand that there are some patients, even high risk patients for surgery, where we should still think about surgery. And this is a decision which can be taken in a good team uh, with people who are open-minded and understanding what is good for the patient. We should not push the limits, otherwise the results will become worse. And we need this paradigm shift from high risk surgery selection to high risk for TAVI selection. How to do that? I think imaging is key, again. And imaging is not a superficial thing. For those who have done 100, 200, 300, 1,000, more than 1,000 procedures, I think today for sure, we know what are the details, which details make the difference. You know, bicuspid is, is, a, is a one definition, but we already know that there are subcategories of bicuspid uh, valves which may be less uh, suitable for, uh, for TAVI. And also we understand that uh, bicuspid in younger patients is associated with some uh, aortic uh, uh, disease. So although bicuspid is treatable with TAVI and there are now trials and there is also a, 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 an indication given in, by the FDA for some devices, I think still we need to be very careful and be very selective in providing this therapy, particularly to young patients. Calcification. Calcification is very rarely a contraindication, but calcification per se doesn't mean anything. Where is the calcium? What kind of risk is uh, associated with a specific calcium distribution, risk of annual rupture, risk of residual PV leak, and so on. We know that very well. For sure, we know, for instance, that a calcification in this area, uh, uh, in this uh, bottom uh, uh, picture on the left, uh, calcification between the left coronary uh, uh, um, and the non-coronary cusp is a very high risk uh, uh, position almost all annual ruptures that I've seen happen in this region, because here there is basically, uh, there is uh, no, uh, no other structures outside. Uh, in the other areas, you don't get annual rupture with, uh, with uh, overt uh, uh, tamponade. Coronary occlusion is uh, pretty rare in native valves. Uh, can happen, but it's pretty rare is more of an issue in valving valves, and we learn this uh, more and more, and we know how to deal with this. And uh, uh, it is a very bad, very bad uh, uh, complication, which is very difficult to manage when it happens. So it is very important to prevent. Again, these kind of videos are very uh, bad. I don't want to see them anymore, but this is real life. We experience that. And uh, we know that there are a number of anatomical factors which can pre predict this kind of, uh, of, this, uh, of, of complications. And in case uh, we have a high risk for this complication, we should reconsider surgery eventually or use other tricks. For instance, we developed in our practice uh, the concept of basilica, which is called electrosurgery uh, uh, for uh, interventional cardiology where we can improve the anatomy uh, to avoid a coronary occlusion. But also important is to use uh, the proper devices to reduce this risk. I will talk about later 
But core occlusion is highly depending also on the on the on the on the device. And actually, Portigo is is a great tool to avoid coronary occlusion because it's a, a very uh, is a, a intraannular prosthesis, self-expanding, and uh, has very large uh, uh, very large cells. But again, talking about Portico, uh, I need to share with you that uh, in uh, Zurich, in the last uh, five years, Portico has been uh, probably the, the valve that we have been using most more often. And the reason is that it is a very uh, uh, the deliverable valve is easy to deliver. I think if there is one uh, advantage over anything else is really is the smallest profile uh, available since ever. We have been using this device for many years uh, sheetless with some tips and tricks. These are not anymore needed because now there is flex nub. So with the inline sheet, you have this, the smallest profile device in the market today to treat aortic stenosis. So uh, this is a picture from 2004. This is an iliac on the stick. We don't want to have it. So it is very important to avoid this complication. I just want to share with you the highest probability of this kind of problems happening in, in uh, smaller pa patients, particularly this lady, particularly those patients who have no calcification. So be aware that the, the highest risk of uh, iliac on the stick is not in calcified vessels, but in patients with no calcification, because the, you know, it may have a spasm around the delivery system and this kind of uh, very difficult complication to, to handle. So again, uh, just to mention about uh, Portico, that it is a true 18 French outer diameter, which means six millimeter outer, outer diameter device, which really allows to make uh, very safe procedures in uh, difficult anatomies. So it is, uh, uh, there will be a video afterwards. So I don't think we need to talk too much about uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, technical uh, details. And if I talk about Portico, I don't want to talk only about one device. I just want to mention that uh, one device does not fit all. You need to have at least two uh, platforms, at least one balloon expandable, one SF expandable, uh, because no single device is best. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages with both. I think uh, hemodynamics is much better with uh, self-expandable uh, and uh, the risk of annual rupture is much less with self-expandable. Although self-expandable has been associated with higher risk of AV block and PV leaks. Although these problems may be really overcome by proper uh, implantation technique and this we heard before. So again, valve selection is very broad. This is an old, old, old picture showing how many devices are available. You need two, at least, to fulfill the needs of your, uh, of your patient population. But with with uh, self-expanding, you really probably, you can serve 95% of patients. Now, <clears throat> the other point about uh, 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 patient selection and, and, and uh, the decision-making is about age. What is the level of age which is important uh, in our practice? So first of all, over the years, we started with 90 years old patients. Today, we treat 70 years old patients. And even in the trials, we have seen the shift and we have seen the shift also in the, in the risk scores. So why this? Because durability of these procedures, of these of this, uh, devices is more important when you go lower age. And I think we all agree that beyond 80, who cares? I mean, I don't, we, nobody cares about durability at this moment. And I think for most of us, 25 years is the threshold. Below 20, uh, beyond 75, there is no discussion. Below 75, we start discussing in some centers, below 70, we start discussing. The threshold is 70, but can we go lower than that. So, and every patient is, has a different uh, perspective. First of all, what we know about durability is mainly derived from the learning curve from uh, a surgical bioprosthesis. And I'm not sure we really can uh, uh, transfer this knowledge directly to the TAVI business. But what we are seeing that durability is much better than we thought initially. I thought it, this, the, the, the TAVI devices would not be so durable. Actually, they are really durable and 
uh, this uh, again, this is a table coming from this uh, review from Barbanti that uh, is showing that basically uh, we have been surprised by durability of TAVI. But is durability the only issue for a young patient? Obviously, yes, it's an important issue, but it's not the only one. First of all, you need to understand again, what is the risk of TAVI even in a younger patient? What is the matter with hemodynamics, uh, with the risk of dysfunction over time, but also the problem with coronary access in the future, the risk of a TAVI in TAVI, nobody knows actually what will be this risk because we have not so many cases done. And eventually, what is the risk of surgical replacement after TAVI for those who need for endocarditis or for other reasons? But also importantly, understand that when we go lower age, there is a higher incidence of, uh, uh, of bicuspid and, and other congenital uh, anomalies of the aortic valve. So we really have to understand that as we go lower age, we encounter more challenges. And uh, these challenges are not only at the level of the valve, but also it's, uh, these patients often, they have a collagenopathy. So you need to understand exactly what is the right decision for these specific patients. And last but not least, but probably more importantly today, we should, we should abandon the idea of uh, uh, indicating one procedure. The indication is for a lifetime management. We need to think not 10 years ahead. We need to think about 20 years ahead. If you have a patient who is 65, he may or she may live until 85. So you need to think 20, 20 years ahead, and one of the big issues could be coronary access. So uh, supraaortic, uh, uh, supraannular devices are a big problem in this regard. So intraannular devices are the device of choice for younger patients. So in, this is uh, more or less what is uh, happening. And again, let's wait for more data before we can really understand uh, this issue of durability of patient selection, age, and so on. And this is my last slide. I think uh, if I want to summarize what is still remaining a challenge, number one, the number one challenge is that there is no more room for mistakes. We need to be very good operators. Number two, we need to understand that there is a paradigm shift. Surgery will not disappear, but will be obviously second line but it is, it is an important second line. So if you have a good surgeon with you, please adopt the surgeons, keep the surgeons close to you because they will be very important for a minority of patients who require high quality surgery. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Messano. It's an, I think, great presentation. You cover all the aspects that people are talking about every day in, in the cath lab on the implant uh, uh, TAVI. Um, I think we'll take some um, um, uh, time with our panelists to just to comment. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions, but we're going to leave it at the end after our third presentation. Uh, Dr. Abdurrahman, kindly. Yes, thank you. It's a nice presentation. I like uh, he started with the, uh, uh, the paradigm shift, the surgery, uh, the TAPI only for the contraindicated patients for surgery. And now he's, he's, uh, he gave the other hand is the... Uh, uh, surgery is only uh, for those who contraindicate for uh, for uh, for TAVI. This is a good statement, and also the in between he raised the issue of the importance of the heart team uh, uh, involvement in the decision, and which is now currently in every uh, uh, currently practice in every single in every single uh, tertiary care center with a good program. So each uh, patient is discussed in a heart team meeting and uh, for the sake of the, uh, what is the best for the patient. And the other uh, things here is the, also the age, to consider the age. Yes, we implanted uh, TAFI in a patient as low as 57 years, but the durability is very important. Uh, though until now is good, the uh, programs started uh, as, uh, uh, as early as 2004, and the durability is good, and also the uh, need for the uh, subsequent surgery for the endocarditis. Yes, for the balloon expandable, it's easier for surgeon to explain the valve, but for the uh, self expandable with the longest stint, probably is some sort of nightmares for the surgeon to explain it after full endothelialization 
and the uh, five also the generations and probably the challenging for Sergei. And the uh, other point is, is uh, uh, he uh, uh, mentioned it was nice uh, statement also is the forum is important and also the operator experience is important. And the uh, last point is the also not only the transcatheter therapy is advancing. Now is the surgery is advancing now. Robotic surgery is probably is, is, uh, is coming on board and more advancing. And endoscopic surgery probably is, it will serve the patient's concern for the, uh, for minimally invasive procedures and uh, make the concerns of the large incision and uh, making the patients reluctant for accepting surgery is more easy now to convince them for uh, also surgery is, is, is coming also less invasive and also is, is good cosmetic wise. And thank you. Quick question for you, Abdurrahman. What's the cutoff age nowadays in your center to be discussed for therapy versus surgery? Uh, we discuss uh, all of the patients, but uh, uh, any patient uh, more than 60, usually we lean towards surgery. But 60 now is we implanted 60, 75, uh, 57, and uh, 60, 65. Because the, uh, now the uh, screening and discovering the uh, disease early, even before advancement, some in the past we wait for the patients until they come to us with advanced symptoms and the benefit probably is less, but we picked the aortic stenosis because it is, is a survival therapy, either surgery or uh, therapy. So we pick the patient early, we screen them early, and we treat them early, whatever the uh, mode of therapy uh, provided to them. But we go down to 60 is acceptable. Oh, thank you very much. Dr. Mohamed Andro? Yeah, thank you, Dr. Francesco, for the excellent presentation. I think there is definite uh, paradigm shift in terms of uh, moving uh, from uh, higher risk patients uh, for TAVR into uh, intermediate risk and perhaps in the future would be low risk. And I, I think um, the importance of heart team has been highlighted uh, quite well in, in your presentation. Uh, I think it is very important to have a, a you know, a heart team discussion in all cases. And uh, our cardiac surgeon is actually quite open to uh, to discuss all uh, aortic valve cases come to, to him. And I think in his view, and probably that's reasonably, you know, reasonable, to say any patient above age of 65 where the surgeons would naturally put a, a tissue valve, then you could argue that uh, TAVA would be uh, as good as uh, SAVA in that case. Above 65 where tissue valve um, uh, 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 longevity is probably the same as, uh, as TAVA valve or, or, or maybe even especially with the new generation and the low hemodynamics with the self-expandable valves like Portico, um, then you, you could even argue that uh, the durability of the uh, tower in this case could be even longer. Uh, I, I think as well, you mentioned about, about Portico valve. In our center, we, we, we use Portico valve, and I think it's actually very good, especially in people who, um, like in Middle East people, where the size of the, of the, uh, of the, of the femoral artery uh, could be small, like 5 to 5.5. Um, uh, average um, uh, millimeter for like a small, small um, uh, person. Uh, so that, that the uh, axis like 14 French could be very useful. Um, the implantation of this uh, 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 NavFlex system is actually easier, more stable. Uh, hemodynamics could be excellent. And especially now with this S-curve uh, technique where you can't implant the valve as high as possible, avoid pacemaker or reduce the risk of pacemaker. So I think the future could be for TAVR, especially in people um, above age of 65. I'm not sure about below 65 for now, but of course that's, again, a discussion for the heart team. Thank you for the presentation. Very much, Dr. Mohammed. I think we'll, go, we'll learn more about uh, Portico's uh, uh, device and uh, with Dr. Fadi presentation and we'll see some cases. Dr. Fadi? Dr. Fadi with us? Can you unmute yourself, Dr. Fadi? All right, sorry, I was muted. Yeah. So I'm, I'm just gonna do a life in a box case I did last week uh, with the Portico system. As you know, the Portico system for the people who don't know is an intraannular valve with uh, very large cells and recently they introduced the new system, uh, which is the FlexNav system. Uh, and I don't think there's a lot of experience with the FlexNav system uh, in our region. And I think uh, 
it's going to shift from people who use the old system who maybe did not like it because it's a very large introducer sheath or they think the deployment was not stable. Uh, I know Dr. Maiziano you, you used to do it um, sheathless, but it also needs some experience with the device. And uh, so I think the new system is going to give us um, some more confidence while deploying. So I'm going to uh, play a live in a box case I did last week. can see the slide, but you cannot hear anything. Is that? Um... You cannot hear it? No. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure how I'm going to do that. One second. You can hear your voice nicely. You want to comment on it? Okay. Uh, uh, let me see. Can you hear now? It's a great pleasure to be with you today. We're going to present uh, Patrick. No, it's a good part. <laughs> Okay, maybe I should, I will speak on top of it, it's okay. Yes, please. Okay, so, so this is, so the lady we did was a 60 old year old lady uh, who had lung CA, had stage three, had um, radiotherapy and um, can you hear me at least? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. So had radiotherapy to her chest. She, she had the fuel cure and she had severe aortic stenosis. So they did an echo on her and she had a valve area of uh, uh, 0.7 and a mean gradient of 64. She had a very low SCS score, very low Euro score, and she had dyspnea on minimal exertion. So this is a patient usually the age and the Euro score, you would go for surgery, but this is someone who got radiation to the chest so she was referred for, uh, for TAVI. So she had, the, this is the echo, mean gradient of 64 with a valve area of 0.7. She had the coronary angiogram that showed um, a, a normal uh, uh, circumflex, non-obstructive disease of the LAD um, and um, no disease, no main seizure disease in the left main. She had a right coronary artery that had also non-obstructive disease. We did an angiogram of the leg at the time of um, our diagnostic angiogram showing a small vessel, some calcium, but acceptable size uh, for TAVI. So we did the CT TAVI protocol. She had large sinuses, 30, 31, 29, with a good uh, left main height of 13.9. She had very thick leaflet that I think is due to radiation, annular size of 75, LVOT size of 74, and it had an annular area, perimeter derived of 23.8. It's a, a, a circular kind of um, annulus, and the LVOT and the annulus is at the same dimension. The right coronary was also high at 16.9, and the STJ was around 25 to 26, so relatively narrow STJ. Uh, STJ. Uh, mild to moderate calcification with thick leaflets, even calcification between the three cusps. The coplanar view was LAO 14 and cranial 9. Uh, we also got the right cusp and left cusp overlap, which was RAO 5 and caudal 11. However, I don't like to use the cusp overlap for the portico system because I don't want to go very high. I prefer it for uh, the Medtronic system because if you go very high with the portico system and you don't have good opening from the beginning, you might embolize while post dilation. So I usually target uh, a bit lower with the, uh, with the portico valve. So this patient with severe aortic stenosis uh, um, with um, indication because of chest radiation, my approach is usually a radial access and a femoral access ultrasound guided, but the patient did not have any radial access from prior cath. I usually 100% of the cases predilate uh, with the portico system. Here, the perimeter derived was around 23.9. So we used um, balloon valvuloplasty with a 22 by 40 ZMAT balloon. We chose the right femoral access uh, to use the next, uh, the FlexNAP system 27 millimeter valve. I usually do one proglide 
with the FlexNav system. And if um, we need to do in any additional closure, I add an angio seal six or eight. But with this system, I always go with one prog light in the middle, and I think it works uh, beautifully. Um, and then I'm gonna go now to the to the, uh, to to explain a bit about the device. So the the FlexNav device is a new device. It has a sheetless approach. Uh, it has also an integrated sheath like with the Evolute R system, and it's very hydrophilic. You put some cell line gauze on it, and it uh, goes very uh, smoothly. And as Dr. Maizano said, this is the lowest profile when you compare it to the Evolute Pro, and it has a real 14 inner diameter and a real 18 uh, outer diameter, which is the lowest um, profile. Not only is it lowest profile, it's one of the most flexible system. So sometimes being small is not the only um, thing we need. We also need a flexible system, especially if you have tortuous uh, arteries and very um, calcified vessel. So they added the stability layer and the stability layer is making the valve deployment much easier, much more predictable, and it doesn't move as, uh, as much as the old system. And they created this uh, new ergonomic uh, handle. It has uh, a wheel that is now uh, clockwise compared to the old system that was counterclockwise. And it has also a tactile indicator. So you have a black marker that goes all the way down to the white between transition between the white and the gray. And when this happens, it will stop. And then you have this button here, the white button which is your uh, lock button. And this usually you have to press it to proceed. And I'm going to show it uh, in my presentation. Um, uh, this is the, the handle from the back. You have one, the flushing port system. You have the sliding buttons. The sliding buttons are used to retrieve the valve, to resheath it after you deploy. The three, if you end up wanting to resheath the, the, the valve, but still you have a gap, you can use the micro adjustment wheel so you don't have a gap between your nose cone and um, and your uh, catheter. And um, the number four and number five and number six. So four is your wheel, five is your uh, lock button that I discussed about, and your number six is your deployment indicator. The deployment indicator, like I said, will show us how far are we deployed. Usually when we reach around 70%, um, uh, it, will, it will stop and then we have to press the button five so we can continue with our deployment. And uh, the seven is your flushing port, eight also, and the nine is where the stability layer. And the number 10 is your introducer sheet, uh, the integrated system. So um, here I'm gonna talk over. So what I do usually, I paste over the wire. Uh, I have, uh, I put a micropuncture wire and the vein without a sheath and I connect it to the negative to the black. And um, what I did here, I did a ultrasound puncture, mid femoral head, common femoral. I put a six French sheath, I put one pro glide, and then I upsized to a 14 French sheath over a stiff wire. And um, as we can tell, the patient was hypertensive, but we had a mean to mean gradient of around um, uh, 40, 40, uh, one second. I'm disconnected here for whatever reason. Can you still see my screen or? Uh, no, we, we lost the... the oh, one second. Hmm. Okay. So we, we have a gradient of, um, of 40 of, um, let me go back here. Okay, so we have a gradient of uh, around peak to peak to 50. So here I have a pigtail and the LV and a pigtail and the aortic valve. I introduce usually a confida wire. In this case, you can introduce a safari wire. It's better always to have a pre-shaped wire. This way you can have a more stable uh, deployment. So we put our stiff wire here. I'm gonna remove uh, my pigtail and then we're gonna go with the valvuloplasty balloon. So usually for the portico valve, I predilate uh, all my valve because the portico valve has a low opening force and uh, sometimes you can have some under expansion. I did my injection here, the LAO 13 cranial nine, which was predicted from the CT, and we have a good coplanar view. So like I said, I usually for the Medtronic valve, I go with the um, cusp overlap for, but for this case, I go with, um, uh, with the three cusp view because I don't want to end up extremely high. Um, 
so I went with a 23, a 22 ZMAT balloon. Um, this is a 22 over uh, by 50 balloon. And then I'm gonna pace over the wire. So what I do, so I, like I said, I have um, a negative um, connection on my uh, micropuncture wire. Then I connect my positive at the end of the back wire. I usually do some scraping and the scraping is to have better contact. And you can, for those who does, don't pace from the wire, you always need to have um, either a balloon, an insulating layer, or the valve close to the uh, end of the, into the aortic valve so you'll be able to pace. So here you can see uh, good capture. I'm pacing here at 120 and I'm gonna ramp up to uh, 180 and you can see a good drop in the blood pressure on the right upper screen and then the second operator Dr. Gazal is gonna go up with the balloon make sure we have a good expansion and when the balloon is fully inflated we deflate so you can know you don't have any indentation and um, uh, you have a full expansion here I was explaining in my video about uh, the, the portico system and uh, this is your um, uh, stability layer I was talking about, and this is your handle um, uh, live. So the handle, like I said, is new. Uh, now you, you deploy in a clockwise ma manner instead of a counterclockwise manner. You have a much more stable deployment with the stability layer. And um, you also can tell how, how far you are from reaching um, the point of no return or the point from the lock system. Um, so it's also a sheathless system. So usually you have to remove the 14 French sheath. So um, here I'm, I'm gonna go back just a tad. I'm, uh, we're gonna remove the 14 French sheath and we're gonna reintroduce the system. So the system, like you can see, is very easy. It, it, it tracks beautifully, like Dr. Maizainu said, it's one of the most flexible system in the market. And this is why it makes it sometimes a simple deployment and it's very good and very tortuous aorta. So I'm gonna put back my um, pigtail and the non-coronary cusp, and then I'm gonna advance my system and go to my implantation angle. So usually how, the way I start, there's this black dot that I only look at at the beginning of my deployment and then I forget. Like the Medtronic system, it has a capsule at the end and you want to try to make it also coplanar. So here you go a bit more LAO and a bit more caudal and you, and you go uh, with your system. So uh, usually I like to pace um, at a, a rapid pacing or fast pacing at 110 or 120. I don't like to go very fast, but the reason I pace, it makes it more stable and it avoids PVCs. Um, and here pacing from the wire is to avoid a pacemaker, uh, avoid a pacing wire. And why do I like to avoid a pacing wire? Because every once in a while you do have um, uh, uh, RV uh, perforation and it's, uh, you wanna try to be as minimalistic and avoid complication. So here the second oper operating is, um, um, unsheathing the valve until it's out of the capsule. When it's out of the capsule, um, here you have to start going slowly. So here I take an injection, make sure I'm at the desired place. Here I'm around to four, uh, four to five millimeter and it's um, a good start of the valve. So here Dr. Gazal is doing one turn and I wait for around five seconds. I wanna make sure the valve is uh, expanding um, beautifully. I don't want to go very fast because if you go very fast, the valve will tend to dive down. As you can tell, the wire is well at the apex so we can have capture of the fast spacing. And now slowly, at one point you keep, you do another injection to make sure <clears throat> you're at the desired uh, position and it did not move. But if you can tell, uh, the, with this valve, it literally, honestly, you can, the first operator can leave, remove his hand, and it doesn't, it doesn't really move, especially if the, if, uh, if the annulus is not very horizontal. So here, um, second operator is continuing to move. Uh, at this point, when you start having contact with the left uh, coronary cusp, you can go a bit higher, a, a bit quicker, and um, you're gonna see uh, Dr. Gazal is going all the way until you hear a crick sound, and then the valve does not go further unless you, 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 you click um, the, the lock button. So now he reached the, uh, the, the lock button, and now we can stop. At this point, 
uh, I'm going to decrease spacing down to um, 110 or to 90. And I'm going to make sure the, the frame of the valve is well squared. Here, I thought the valve was a bit on the higher side, because if you look at the left corner recusp, I'm, 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 I'm a bit uh, high. And if I deploy this position, I might have a perfect result. But I'm going to be a bit scared if I'm going to post dilate that it pops out. So the Rishi thing um, um, with this valve is extremely uh, easy. Uh, you don't have um, difficulties like with the old system. And as if because it's an intraannular valve, even when you're resheating, you don't lose the pre blood pressure like with the Medtronic system. So what I am decided to do here is to do a partial, re partial resheath. I didn't do a full resheath. I started pacing um, also around one, uh, 120 to 140. And when I uh, thought that the, um, I went two to three millimeter lower, I uh, unsheathed again a bit quicker this time. And... Um, I think we, we were able to get to the desired uh, height. Um, I'm going to uh, reach the same way at 70 as before. I'm going to take an injection and make sure that uh, we're not high at the left coronary cusp. At least I have two to three millimeter. And here we're going to see um, the injection. So at the right lower bottom frame, you see the inject uh, injector. Uh, we're uh, five millimeter at the non coronary cusp, adequate height, and we're at two to three millimeter at the left coronary cusp. So here I'm happier with my deployment. So I only went down two millimeters more, but now I feel safer if I'm going to deploy this valve. Um, I'm, I'm not going to embolize. So what you see me doing on the, uh, with the wire, I'm going to pull the wire a bit just to remove the tension. So I have my forces. Uh, not embolize the valve. So now I pressed my button with my uh, right hand, and now I can unsheath a bit more. I go to 80 or 90% at the point of no return, and I wait for around uh, two to three minutes. And the reason why I wait two to three minutes, because I want the portico valve um, frame to open fully and to uh, settle well uh, inside the annulus. And when it's settling well inside the alunus and it, you wait two to three minutes, the valve is not, is not going to embolize. It's going to stay in its place, and it's not going to move at all. So now uh, what I'm doing, I'm having a gentle, gentle push with my uh, left hand. And the second operator is completing the um, unsheathing process. And the unsheathing process happens very slowly. You don't want to do it very quick, so you don't have the valve jumps. Uh, contrary to the metronic valve, the portico valve has three uh, attachment tabs. So you want to make sure that the three tabs are detached. Because if I've seen operators pulling, not having the, the tabs all detached, and you embolize your valve. So in order to make sure the three are uh, detached, I'm going to go from an LAO to an RAO, um, make sure the three are detached. And you can see one, two, three are detached. See one, two. Uh, I did a cine, and you can see two on the uh, right of the screen and one to the left of the screen. So now I'm comfortable um, um, removing. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to push my wire back and I'm going to retrieve my valve. And now I retrieve it to the descending aorta. After I retrieve it to the descending aorta, I'm going to use the, the the macro slides, the, the, uh, the lever two I explained before. And uh, this is going to be my uncheating mechanism. So I have my left hand fixed. And the right hand, I'm going to press the two tabs and pull it away from my left hand. And this is how you resheath the valve. You want to make sure you don't um, uh, unsheath uh, a lot. So here, if we look at the hemodynamics, I'm, I'm going to pause a bit. We don't have a gradient. And we have a relatively good separation between the aortic <clears throat> diastolic and the LVEDP. The LVEDP was 5. The aortic diastolic was 60. So here, I'm going to take an injection. Um, on the injection, there was a uh, mild paravalvular leak. So I, did the, I usually do a bedside echo. And there was um, a mild to mild plus, maybe, um, PVL, because this is a young patient, I want to leave her with zero PVL, especially that she's uh, active. Uh, she used to be active and now uh, wants to go back to exercising. If this was an 85-year-old uh, gentleman, I would probably would have left it. So I took a 23 Z-Med balloon here, 
almost one-to-one -one inflation, and I did a post dilation at 200. You can see the frame is opening completely. Uh, I deflated my balloon, and um, I think uh, we had full expansion. You all, always look in RAO and LAO, make sure the valve is fully ex uh, expanded. Um, I, I usually do my final injection. I go into the RAO caudal view, and I did a full injection here, and there was no PVL at all. Uh, your, if you look also, your diastolic pressure is now um, almost 65, and um, we reach where we wanted, and we had no gradient. We had closure. This is one closure with one proglide um, uh, with adequate closure. And the conclusion of this case that we were able to do a complex patient with small vessels using one proglide, we had no um, new left bundle branch block, uh, which is also important for somebody who's 65 because there's some data that the left bundle branch block on the long run can cause heart failure and increase heart failure hospitalization. So no left bundle, no gradient, no leak, uh, no ephemeral complication. And also we use in a young patient an intraannular device because if we're going to do uh, a TAVI in TAVI in the future, we're going to hopefully um, have um, good coronary access. And in this patient who's 65, in order to have easy coronary access, uh, an intraannular valve is uh, my valve of choice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Pad. It's a great um, demonstration and information about the portico system. Um, I think it's, uh, it's an excellent case. Uh, uh, you catch up and, and, and describe it yourself in a, in a very good way. I think we'll start with Dr. Misano. I think you, you have some questions, Dr. Pad, and also would like to, you to share with us uh, kindly your experience with the portico valve. So, uh, first of all, I am uh, uh, really fascinated by uh, this uh, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, you know, it's not easy to present so well uh, a new procedure because it's, uh, uh, I think uh, we have a very limited experience at this moment with, uh, with the FlexNav. What I think is the main, there are two main uh, advantages of the FlexNav today. One is uh, that uh, a sheetless approach is uh, feasible in all hands. It was uh, a little bit tricky to do it without uh, the inline sheet, uh, but I think today is uh, available for everybody. One uh, suggestion is that uh, you should not always, in all, if you have a patient with very small access, I would suggest to try not to introduce the full sheath in, just put only the tip of the inline sheath to avoid the iliac on the stick uh, problem. The other point is about uh, the, uh, uh, the stability layer, which has been added. And I think this is another in very important advantage. Uh, you know, a portico was a valve uh, which required a lot of experience to achieve the height of implantation uh, desired compared to uh, Evolut or for sure compared to balloon expandable valves. And this was because it was uh, without this, uh, this, this, uh, this layer. So today when you start deploying valve and if you make sure you deploy slow enough, you will be really able to deploy where you want it, the height you want it and uh, you don't need to rush because this valve is uh, uh, not impeding forward flow, different from Evolt. So really you have all the time you want. Now, very important uh, uh, feedback I would like to share with uh, the, the audience. Uh, this valve is, uh, has less metal compared to an Evolt. This is an advantage because of the flexibility, deliverability, because of the cells which are more la larger and then you have better uh, access to the coronaries. But it has a drawback that the expansion force is limited. So you need to predilate every patient and we have seen that uh, very well. And also you need to be sure that the valve is completely expanded because if uh, it is locked into the commissure, it may not expand fully and you have these uh, overlapping uh, uh, um, uh, cells. Now, for this reason, we made a mistake for many years uh, here in Zurich, and we learned this. 
recently that you should not use a very stiff wire. We were using a, a, a actually we were using a backup wire because it was very easy to deliver the valve up to the uh, up to the level, uh, even in very tortuous anatomies and and and, and the very complex uh, uh, iliac uh, anatomies. Then we understood that by using a very stiff wire, you are really forced to deploy the valve inside of the commissure between the non and the right coronary uh, cusp. And this would, in many cases, bring to uh, inefficient expansion. So we switch to a less uh, st stiff wire, like we see in a Confida is, is one a good solution, but there are many uh, different wires you can use. So my advice is to use a softer wire with this device because the delivery system is very soft. And so, and it allows you also to play a little bit with uh, with the wire to achieve good co uh, uh, coaxiality. But you know, if you learn how to use it after a short learning curve, and now is much shorter with this new uh, new delivery system, I think this is the device, the self-expanding device, which has the the wider uh, options because you can really deliver this valve from everywhere. We have done it from the subclavian, which is our uh, solution number one, uh, uh, but you can deliver from carotid from everywhere, and so we we like this device because of this. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Messano. Dr. Kochman, uh, your experience. Yes, I mean yes. Uh, uh, I would also like to congratulate because this was really beautifully presented and executed. And uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Savaya and, uh, and Dr. Maidana raised the important points, uh, which are once a slow deployment. This is, we call it a social vibe. You don't have to rush, you can talk to each other and really uh, go slow with the employment. And what was also stressed is that the, the, the fact that this is an intra annular valve. Uh, makes you feel comfortable. The patient generally generally tolerate this very well, and and we've done like you know twenty cases probably now with this with this uh, flex nav uh, system, and and you really do not see any any hemodynamic compromise. And uh, uh, the the last thing I would say because I, I haven't seen it uh, maybe at, at the presentation that when you uh, are, let's say, at this 80% of, of uh, valve deployment, you should always look whether you don't have a parallax. So you should adjust your uh, C arm to see the, the bottom of the, of the valve as a line. This is important to really assess uh, the, the employment depth. And, uh, uh, although, uh, as Dr. Savaya said, that uh, the valve may have a greater tendency to pop out as compared to, uh, to evolute R, I would say that we insist on checking the position in the area of because probably uh, uh, I was looking at the, at the first attempt, probably if you would have changed the undulation it might turn out that the, the, the employment death is, is really good. But otherwise, you know, really beautiful, and perfect, perfect uh, case. Thank you very much, Dr. Kochman. Um, uh, Dr. Mogheri, just share with us also your experience. I think you have 15 or 16 cases so far in your center, in all generations. Yes, uh, thank you for the sharing this case. It was a good demonstration for the Baltic of Al. The, uh, just only the points, just to reinforce that in comparison, the metronic valve, yes, less cells and less uh, radial force compared to the metronic, but the other one, uh, the things with, comes with the valve, you have to have a pre dilatation is preferable, uh, or post dilatation if you do not, uh, because the cells need to, to uh, increase the radial forces. The other thing is the good thing in the valve, it opens at 20%. So once the tissue contact, is obtained. So you relax and the valve is functioning well at 20% then uh, continues to function. Well, that's why the operator is relaxed and, and uh, comfortable with uh, deploying it in a slow uh, manner. 
The other thing is is a neutral position. You don't need to push forward. You don't need to pull for the system. So the, for releasing the valve, just continue without. And for the buttons, yes, they make it easy. It's because the this is the concept of the uh, San Jude or uh, Abbott valve from the beginning. The uh, safety button to stop at 80 percent, even in the uh, old delivery, and continue to be more easy in this uh, new delivery. The other thing, yes, we had the old uh, delivery system, but we uh, delivered the patient, the files, in majority of cases in a sheathless uh, approach, and it was successful in that uh, one, uh, and that, uh, in those cases. And uh, also the, uh, the other uh, point to, uh, to raise is the continuing advancing with the uh, new technology. Yes, the making it easy, either for Medtronic or Abbott or uh, Edwards, they make their valves more flexible, more, and also this uh, and this. And uh, for the new future, probably the new generations is more easy to, and more sizes they added about in this in this valve. Uh, it, it was only they stop at uh, 29, now probably is, is coming 31 uh, size, and probably is 34 or, or uh, more, but at least is one size more is coming. Uh, and also with the same 14 French. This is good for the, and for those who don't have the reshaped wires, either Safari or Confida wire, don't be upset because any uh, extra support wire can work. Either the Amblatz extra support, you can shape it, or land post wires uh, can, can work. So it's, it's good to have this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, approach whatever the experience you build up with the time, it's, it's good. Anyway, it's a good file, it's comparable to uh, the uh, competitors. I think it's going to be successful and parallel to the, and complementary to each other, the all vibes. Excellent. Uh, you. Dr. Mohammed, uh, your, your um, thoughts and comments? Can you unmute yourself, uh, please? Sorry, sorry, yes, yes. Thank you very much, Dr. Fadi, for a wonderful case. As usual, you made it look so easy. Uh, and I think, uh, I think with the new system, is no doubt uh, um, it has a lot of advantages. The, the low profile, the easy to uh, cross around the aortic arch, and the deployment is actually so predictable. You don't have to resheath, and you could relax uh, so much. And just <laughs> simply just let the valve uh, deploy itself through the second, uh, second operator because of this uh, stability um, um, layer. Uh, again, I think you know the, the, the issue here about pre-dilatation is so important because the, the opening force of the valve um, is lower than other uh, valves. So the preparation of the valve is like, if you have a thin strut uh, uh, stent, you have to prepare the valve very well and perhaps pre-prepare to post-dilate. So here on, on this, I would like to ask to find maybe his, with his experience. Pre-dilatation, would you use, for example, the uh, perimeter to guide your, your balloon size or for pre-dilatation, or you want to use, or you use the minimum diameter from the derived area or, um, and, and, and for post-dilatation, um, so, you know, just if, if, you have, if you can give us some... Uh, uh, your, yes, your, I usually, your... I usually, if there's no risk of annular rupture, if you don't have a lot of LVOT calcium or a nodule, I go perimeter minus one. That's my approach. Some people do the minor axis. And for post-dilation, I go one-to-one -one usually. Uh, if you have severe calcification, I might use a non-compliant balloon, like a true balloon. I usually use a ZMED. Uh, for my predilation, but I've deployed uh, Portico an extremely calcified valve, and in these cases, I will use um, uh, a true balloon or an atlas balloon, so you can crack the calcium, open the commissures, because you're definitely going to have an under expansion if you don't. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Muhammad, uh, so we'll go back to Dr. Fadi. So, one of the question is if, if the cat lab uh, have a, a TAVI program and they're already using self expandable or, or, and balloon expandable valve. Mm -hmm. What things make them uh, uh, take Portico in their, in their uh, uh, program? And, uh, is there any, any different or any special thing other than what we're talking about that can force any center to get Portico? I mean, I think in very uh, calcified, small vessel, very tortuous, I think it does a very good job in uh, tracking. Uh, I've had cases 
with other self-expanding valves that have a stiff system, uh, you, end, you end up putting two Lunderquist so you can cross the aortic arch, uh, creating some anxiety during the case. And I've never had uh, this with the portico system. So the main advantage, I think, is deliverability. And uh, advantage versus other supraannular self-expanding, if I have a very young patient and uh, I want to preserve my coronary axis, I'm not going to go with a, a supraannular valve. And uh, funnily enough, with the portico, I, although it's an intraannular valve, the hemodynamics is better than the Edwards, for example. So it's funny, it's an intraannular, but with very good hemodynamics. As far as for durability, I, I don't think, Doc, uh, Dr. Marziano, you probably have the largest experience. I'm not sure uh, about the long-term durability. We have eight uh, years, nine years with the other valves, but so far from my experience, I've had no redos. Great. Uh, so I think we're reaching the last five minutes of our presentation. It's been a, g a great time to, to go over uh, uh, your experience. We'll allow each one of you kindly to uh, have a, a final thoughts and, and messages to our audience. We'll start with Dr. Um, Messano, please. So well, thank you for a few, a few seconds to address the audience uh, about, uh, again, the challenges of uh, today's study. We heard, we have been hearing a lot about Portico, which again, I think is a, is a, is a very good device. And I will, not, I will not advise you to use one or, or another one, another device. I think you need to use the one that you want to use. There are uh, advantages and disadvantages for each device. But once you choose one, you should really stick to this one and become proficient to this one. And in our experience, uh, you know, we, we implanted up to more than 30% of patients with Portico. And uh, uh, we have been really successful in having uh, excellent results. But this is achieved through the knowledge of the details. As we have seen today, there are so many details to achieve excellence uh, because, again, uh, the bar is very high at the moment. We are not treating any more uh, inoperable patients. We're treating all comers. So uh, operator ex excellence is fundamental, and this can be only done with the large volumes and with focus with one device, understanding all the, the, fe the features uh, so that you can deliver safe and effective treatments. Thank you for your attention and thank you for having me uh, with you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kochman. Can you unmute yourself, please? Uh, I would say that, you know, this has been a very uh, interesting uh, webinar and we had the opportunity to, to learn from each other, from, from people that are experienced in, um, uh, in TAVI programs. And uh, as I would actually repeat what Dr. Maizano said, that, that you should have always uh, a choice, at least a two valves, one expandable, uh, self-expandable and one uh, balloon expandable. And uh, I would agree, as we have also very good experience with, with Portico, that this is a, a, a valve that it's, it's uh, well, on the same level as the, as the second generation valve. Hopefully we will see soon the, the further improvement with this uh, uh, cut of, with this uh, uh, ceiling skirt uh, to really decrease the, the number of, uh, of PVS. So, uh, well, I, I would like to thank for the invitation and for, for, for having me and hopefully uh, I managed to, to do my job properly. Thank you very much, Dr. Koshman. Dr. Paddy? Yes, uh, I'm going to agree with um, the speakers. Thank you for this webinar. I think uh, we wanted to give an overview about how to do TAVI from step to step and, and to hopefully shed the light about the new FlexNav Portico system because it's a kind of a new CE Mark device and I think it's going to get uh, more integrated in the market. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fadi. Dr. Abdurrahman, kindly. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, inviting us to participate and to share the experience with this. And uh, yes, we uh, reinforce that the, uh, all the files are equal based on the clinical results. It's each device, they have their own uh, studies and the clinical uh, randomized and observational, uh, plus the registries to support the successful 
uh, story on this uh, valve. And yes, we do have some uh, cases of redo valve, uh, either TAVI and TAVI or uh, surgical valve for a reason or another. Uh, with the portico valve, the uh, few cases we did, around 16 cases, we did not see the patient came back with the, an issue. The uh, durability is so far is good. Uh, and also with the balloon expander, also we have some redo cases and also successful. Uh, we have two programs for balloon expandable, two programs for the uh, self expandable, and all successful. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Muhammad. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presenters uh, and thank you about for the invitation. And I think uh, we just have to say that the tower is here to stay. It's excellent technology, uh, importance of hard team discussion, patient selection. And I think thank you for the industry, uh, all the companies just uh, making a huge effort to improve their uh, devices. And now the bar revival leak and the pacemaker rate have been reduced to um, very, very low levels. So we can use the technology to our younger patients. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of you, our speakers, uh, dear panelists, and the uh, audience. Uh, we wish that in the last 90 minutes, we managed to uh, meet your expectation and go over the update in TAVI and uh, special um, uh, uh, interest in uh, Portico. In GIS, we are committed for more education. So far, we did more than 16 uh, webinars for physician. We did more than eight uh, uh, webinars for technician and nurses in the cath lab. We did more than two uh, e-workshops. We still have more webinars for position. We still have more workshop for rotablation, OCT, and IVOS in, in the near future to come. Please uh, uh, watch our emails and advertisement channel uh, to get the update from GIS. I would like to thank, uh, uh, again, our speakers and panelists. Thank Abbott for the support. And thank you very much, and have a good night. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye.